Good afternoon, everybody. This is Cybertile back at you with all things chess. Got a snazzy new shirt. Whenever you have fancy plans, always bring a snazzy new shirt with you. Uh, we're continuing our examination of how to attack properly when you possess the Hanging Pawns. We're looking at an absolute classic in that genre. It is, to my knowledge, the shortest game, the shortest loss I ever experienced by Boris Spassky. Uh, he had the white pieces here. Uh, possessor of the black pieces is Mikhail Tal. Uh, that's one explanatory factor for why Spassky got crushed so quickly, because Tao was uh, fairly good at attacking, if you haven't heard. Um, yeah, let's dive right into the game. This is a um, little bit of history about Tao first. This game was played in 1979. Um, Tao is sort of a legendary figure in chess, because he is such a romantic figure in terms of his attacking ability. He would just conjure up pure brains out of absolute nothing and win games out of seemingly uh, complete chaos. Uh, the young Tal of the 50s up to 1960 was sort of prime Mikhail Tal, where he had a lot of flaws as a chess player. He had a lot of, uh, didn't know a whole lot about positional chess. Uh, his opening theory was a little bit hazy, but it's just this pure tactical brilliance just completely overwhelmed every other factor. He just completely annihilated even the best players in the world. He annihilated Smyslov. He annihilated... Uh, but Vinnick eventually for the world title. Every world class player you face, you just, his tactical ability completely overwhelmed them. Um, Mikhail Tal had a lot of bad luck with health. Uh, he was born um, with the condition that fused uh, his uh, four of his fingers into two fingers in his right hand. He was also born with a diseased kidney and several other uh, physical ailments. He needed several operations throughout his life. His rematch in 1961, he was plagued by that kidney. Eventually, he was able to have that kidney removed, and he was in much better health throughout the uh, 70s and 80s. That led to two... Oddly enough, Mikhail Tal possesses two of the longest streaks of un undefeated chess of all time, which when you think of a style, you think is an aggressive, risky chess. And yet he's gone... Un he had those two streaks of going undefeated almost more than any other player in history. Um, so the late, the late clear, uh, career of Mikhail Tal... He sort of fused this tactical brilliance with sort of a positional understanding he didn't have as a younger player. Uh, and that led to some magnificent chess. So this is one of the prime calling cards for Mikhail's, Mikhail Tal's later life. Uh, Spassky was white here. D4. Knight F3. This was the trend of the 70s and 80s. Uh, the Nimzo ending was in incredibly good shape uh, at that time. So a lot of white players were playing Knight F3 to dodge the Nimzo ending. Of course, this goes in ebbs and flows. Uh, nowadays, the Nimzo Indian is still respected, but it's not so feared that people actively avoid it. You see knight f3 and knight, C, uh, knight, f3 and knight c3 in equal measure nowadays. Uh, the line that was sort of in vogue back then, included just for trivia's sake, or if you want to try, give, uh, give the line a try. This is one of my repertoire lines, so I would recommend it. Um, this is the this is the Hubner variation, and this was coming into vogue in the 70s and 80s. Uh, West German Grandmaster Robert Hubner, he brought this into uh, Praxis and did extraordinarily well with it, and it very quickly caught on. Um, this was actually Aaron Nimzovich's original idea for his own opening, uh, but it never really caught on until Hubner uh, analyzed it properly and played it and codified it. Um, very a very uh, simple chess. We weaken the white pawn structure, and then we arrange the rest of our pawns in dark squares to amplify the power of a remaining white squared bishop. Very simple. And then often in these lines, the pawn on c4 will end up being weak. Um, so we can play something like b6, knight e5, bishop a6. That's a long-term goal. You don't typically play it that quickly. Um, the original idea of the Hubner was that you leave the king in the center, because sometimes you can actually castle queenside. Uh, it's actually quite safe in the queenside, because there's no pawn breaks left in the queenside, because of those damaged pawns. Uh, nowadays, c5 is under a cloud, because of knight e2. So the modern way of reaching the Hubner is castles. Bishop d3. C5, knight f3. Then you can play d6. I think those are interchangeable. And then knight c6 here. So basically, uh, it's like the previous variation we looked at, except both sides have castles. Um, this reduces a little bit of black's flexibility, but it's still quite good for black. Um... This has never been refuted for black. It's not popular nowadays because it's more of a closed position, so it's harder to prepare with your computer for this line. 
Um, but this is very flexible and very sound for black. I would absolutely recommend this to someone that wants to get a good position out of the opening, but they don't want to study opening theory all the time. Um, here, the value of the moves will be weighed more by positional understanding than memorization of opening theory or tactical sharpness. Uh, so just a quick aside, that was the fashionable line of the 70s and 80s, so a lot of white players are playing that F3 to dodge the Nimzo. Uh, B6, this is the Queen's Indian defense. Um, yet another insidious hypermodern variation. Again, the point of a hypermodern variation is controlling central squares with pieces instead of pawns. So this bishop is going to hop to b7 to directly control the e4 square instead of playing d5 to control with a pawn. Uh, back in the 20s, when these opening lines were still first formulated, this was very controversial, and figures like Tarash sort of invade heavily against them. Um, now it's just a part of chess. We don't even think twice about seeing these openings. It's just a different way of playing that's just as classical and respected as a queen's game declined. Uh, e3, Spassky was always a look low in the opening theory. Uh, he wasn't necessarily... It would be unkind for me to call him lazy, because he's a better player than I will ever be in my life. Um, but he certainly didn't work as hard on opening theory as, say, a Poliaski. Um, E3 is a low opening theory method, but it just tries to get a game of chess on the board. Um, the critical variation, G3, this was actually formulated by Akiba Rubinstein in response to the Queen's Indian pretty much immediately. This is yet another... Um, main opening choice that was invented by Cube Rubenstein. You find his fingerprints all over modern chess. That's amazing. Um, and then black has two main choices here. Bishop b7 is the classical way of doing it. You just immediately control the e4 square. And then bishop a6. This is actually another uh, idea of Nimzovich's. This sort of looks like a more modern and crazy idea, but Nimzovich played this basically as soon as he invented the Queen's Indian. Uh, black is trying to get white to play b3, and then he'll try to prove that b3 is a weakness somehow. Uh, both both moves are equally respected, they just have different feels to them. If you're interested in the Queen's Indian, I would recommend you experiment with both of them just to see which one's a better fit for you, but both are perfectly fine. But e3 was played. Uh, d5, I'll go through the opening a little bit quicker because we had a discussion there. This is reaching sort of a Zucker Torts, Kali Zucker Torts, uh, which isn't necessarily bad for white, but White certainly hasn't fought for an OB advantage with this choice. He's just getting a game of chess on the board, which is perfectly fine. Um, so this is a very normal position. Hundreds of games have reached this position. Knight bt2 is the first move where I might say something. Um, just like one of the hanging pawn, or the uh, Nimzovich Tarsh game we looked at a few decades ago, I might not necessarily recommend this move. Knight c3 would be my preference. It's a little bit more aggressive. Um, Generally, when you reach these hanging pawn structures, you want to have your minor pieces as active as possible to immediately attack the hanging pawns. Um, as we'll see once we reach the hanging pawns, a knight on d2 just doesn't do anything to attack hanging pawns that might suddenly appear in d5 and c5. Whereas a knight on c3, it's already hitting the d5 pawn, it can hop to b5 to hit that bishop. A lot of times they'll go to a4 to stare at the c pawn that suddenly appears... Uh, so knight bd2, it's a normal move, but it's not the move I would recommend. It makes the knight a little bit passive. Uh, if this knight never moves from f3, this knight doesn't really have a place to move. Uh, basically, knight bd2 relies on white either achieving e4 or white playing knight e5. Uh, otherwise, the knight's just going to sit there passively. Uh, queen e7, this is common. One defensive resource, if white's attack gets a little bit strong, is to play bishop a3 to try to liquidate. Also, if white takes on d5... Uh, then the queen is well-placed to stare at the e5 square. Also, black can achieve e5 in himself with this move. So, excellent move. Rook c1, I might say something about this move, too. We don't yet know if this rook actually belongs on the c-file. Uh, no files have opened up, so we don't actually know if this square is a good square for the rook. Um, in these sort of uh, dynamic positions where central pawns are sort of in stasis and there's a bunch of different captures that could happen... Typically, the side that commits their rooks um, is making a mistake, just because you don't know which way those are going to shake out. Um, I'm a, I would prefer queen c2 instead. Um, you're immediately staring at the e4 square, so that prevents that e4 as a resource. You're looking to achieve e4 eventually. Um, just looks like a, a much more pointful move. Uh, whereas rook c1, it's not necessarily bad. We just don't know if the rook belongs in c1 yet. 
Uh, Rook AD8, same story. I would prefer C5, just because we don't know if that Rook actually belongs on D8. Uh, but again, these these moves aren't necessarily bad, just slightly inflexible. Uh, but it's Spassky and Tile, so they probably know what they're doing. Uh, so Queen C2, good move. C5. All right, and now we finally reached a classic hanging pawn position. This is pretty much balance. Um, subjectively, I would prefer black. And let me explain some reasons why after I sip this delicious de Alcohol and chess go together just like, hmm. Um, so as I've said in the past few videos, when you transition into a hanging pawn structure, you want to try to get pressure on the hanging pawns as quickly as possible. The knight MD2 sort of puts a spanner in all those works for white. If this knight were on c3, white could actually reliably get pressure on the hanging pawn somewhat quickly. He could play knight a4 and bishop a3 with a little bit more preparation, and suddenly he can start trying to get some pressure on those hanging pawns. With the knight MD2, there's no minor piece maneuvering that can really glean pressure on those pawns. If white plays bishop a3, well, that's not creating a threat. Black can just ignore it and continue to prep up his own kingside attack. Um, now, that, is, that doesn't necessarily mean that white is worse. Um, White's position is actually quite solid, and he can sort of build up his own position and solidify things in preparation for that kingside pressure. But that's exactly what he'll be doing. He won't be actively pressuring the hanging pawns. He'll be preparing to defend and solidifying his own position. There's a difference between the two. Practically, Attacking is much easier than defending. And we actually see this in the game. We see this in the entire career of Mikhail Tal, in fact. It is much easier to attack than defend. It is psychologically difficult to face a raging attack on your king. Um, just it, For some reason, we are so built that it's much more fun and enjoyable to find those beautiful attacking moves than find those grim defensive moves that hang on. Uh, we are human beings playing a chess game. What works practically shouldn't be overlooked. We're not silicone beasts playing perfect chess. We're subjective creatures sort of mutually creating an aesthetic achievement in chess. So what practically works shouldn't be ignored. Um, typically in these positions where there's no immediate pressure on the hanging pawns, the side with the hanging pawns does much better because they get that attack on the king side. Look at the way the bishops are lined up. Bishop on d6 and bishop on b7. This is exactly what you want from hanging pawns. They're immediately set up for pressure. Um, all of Black's pieces are quite well developed and they're ready to go. Um, again, objectively, this is equal. But I think practically, this is a difficult position for White to hold because he's really just looking to passively hold on and face White's pressure. Um, Queen c3. Objectively, I don't think this is a mistake, but I think subjectively, this is the first error. Um, I think bishop f5 would be my choice. Um, White's looking to take on d7 at an opportune time to try to get pressure on those hanging pawns. Otherwise, you can also play g3 and bishop h3, and then drop the bishop back to g2, and that sort of helps solidify his king side. Then, after, say, rook f1, this is a very tense position. This is still uh, quite equal. Uh, queen c3, again, it's not objectively a mistake. It doesn't weaken anything about White's position, but the idea behind it is bad. White's idea is that he's going to play queen a5 at some time. Um, that is direly misplacing the queen. That is bringing the queen all the way out, isolated to the far end of the board, at a time when black is absolutely building up for a savage kingside attack. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but black is Mikhail Tal. Uh, he knows a thing or two about attacking the kingside. Um, you don't need to ask him twice to pop a cap. Uh, and queen c3 is sort of begging for that said cap. Um, so rook fe8, Tile finishes development. When you look at the games of the greats, you notice that they always finish developments. They never let a piece hang out on the other side of the board. And when you see a game of the greats where there's some undeveloped pieces, that side typically loses reliably every time. Always make sure all your pieces are developed before you go into battle. Rook fd1, finish mobilizing. Again, this position is still balanced, but I, I vastly prefer black because he has all the aggressive chances. D4, so uh, a lot of hoo-ha has been written about this move that I think is probably not correct. Um, this is a game covered by Kasparov in his great predecessor series. He gives us a, a question mark exclam, but says it's practically 
an excellent choice and a sort of a typical Tau choice. Um, I mean, just going over this move with the engine, it really isn't all that different in evaluation of what the correct move is. So, objectively, the correct positional move is h6. This is a small, improving move. Uh, maybe even play g5, knock the knight back, but it just slightly improves the position and asks white to find a move. Um, but d4 is a pawn sacrifice, and objectively, it's very dangerous. Um, this is when you, you read older books, you read a lot of weird bullcrap about Mikhail Tao. You read that he was a, a magician, a sorcerer, he would hypnotize people. You read a lot about the Mikhail Tao glare. You know, you'd see a couple pictures of him on the boards. Uh, Pal Benko brought some sunglasses to the board to try to block the, the brutal Tao glare. Uh, weirdly enough, he's still lost. Um, I mean, I, I think all of that's just nonsense. When you actually look at Mikhail Tao's games, the moves he played were not all that incorrect. You, you look at his games and you see these wild sacrifices and you think there's no way this is ob objectively correct. You sit down with the engine, you let it run for a while, and you actually analyze the position. It is correct. Mikhail Tao was vastly ahead of his time in understanding the dynamics of chess. Uh, the time he came along in the 50s, it, it was sort of stuck in the paradigm of the Mikhail Botvinnik positionally correct, playing to the demands of the position. There's only one correct way to play. Mikhail Tao completely broadened our horizons, and he showed us that there are numerous ways to play with the demands of the position. It just depends on your own personal tastes. Um, here, you, you sit down with the engine, you actually let it run, and you analyze positions come forth. I think this is objectively just as fine as a quiet move like h6. But subjectively, it's so much a better choice, because it's putting immediate pressure on white. And that's exactly why Tao won. He didn't win because of his glare or because he hypnotized people. He won because attacking is much easier than defending, and he was ahead of his time vastly in terms of his understanding of dynamics of how to attack. He would bring the sort of pressure that was 50 years ahead of its time, the sort of pressure that Kaspara brought in players in the 80s and 90s, the sort of pressure that's... Uh, I'm thinking of a good attacking player from today. Uh, Ding Liren. He has a fairly aggressive style. The, the sort of concrete, fad-free style of chess where you just bring relentless pressure upon your opponents. Uh, now, in analysis of this game, we see... White is still fine, but when you're bringing pressure and you're attacking instead of defending, your opponent's much more likely to make a mistake, because attacking is that much easier than defending. And Spassky more or less goes wrong immediately in this game. Um, subjectively, this is still balanced, but subjectively, this is a great position for Black. He has wonderful attacking chance, and again, this is exactly what you want to do when you have the hanging pawns. When you have your bishops lined up like this... When you have all of your pieces developed, you know, the rooks are on e8 and d8, perfectly set up, the queen's on e7, it's time to open the position. Even if this is a pawn sacrifice, it's time to open the position up, go after the white king. It's You strike while the iron's hot. E, D, C, D, queen a5. And this is how much easier it is to attack and defend. White, former world champion, all-time great player, goes wrong instantly. And it's not because he's hypnotized by Tal, it's facing an aggressive attack is scary, even for a cool hand like Boris Spassky. And you get intimidated by these positions where the side you're facing has these great attacking chances. Um, it's hard to say what Spassky was thinking, but I'm guessing after knight xd4, he was afraid of the classic sacrifice bishop x h2. But it's simply not working here. Now, as an aside, black is still perfectly fine, because... After the quiet move, bishop f4, um, black actually has full compensation here. Uh, and I give a couple lines in the game notes. I don't want to go too far into the video and looking at these. Uh, but in the game notes to the comments of the video, you can see that uh, black is doing just fine. The, the compensation basically lives on uh, after the quiet move. But real quickly, to show why this doesn't work, uh, king g3 is just the key move. F4, and this just isn't this just isn't working for for Black. Uh, white uh, White has two moves here. Bishop x h7 is the best, but even after 
this, which Spassky might have seen up to. He might have thought this was scary. Um, but this is still much better for um, white, if not completely winning. But it is very complex. But after the relatively simple Rishbex H7, um, this is just a flat-out winning position for white. White's a pawn up. He's got a bishop versus a knight, which is usually a fairly uh, favorable outcome. Uh, his rook is aiming to land in the C7 square. It's got that nice open file. Um, this is just a flat-out technically winning position for white. Um, for a, for a world-class player like Spassky, these variations are not hard. You know, even for a schmuck like me, I could see up to this point, and I could sort of see to myself, like, well, you know, black has some pressure, but this isn't necessarily something you should be afraid of. Um, whereas after the game choice... In retrospect, we see that this is just an abysmal decision. You know, at a time when the black, uh, white king side is under dire pressure, the white queen is sort of stranding itself off in the corner, away from the main fight. You know, this even if the queen wins the a pawn, so what? You know, black's going to be mating within a few moves if he breaks through. Um, but th this isn't what the hypnotic nature of Tau does. It's what a savage attack attacking threat creates against defense, because defending is so much harder than attack. So in your own per personal games, uh, be aggressive. Fight for the initiative. Fight uh, fight against the enemy king. Uh, forcing your opponent to defend almost always proves to uh, reap dividends, because it is very hard to defend. So queen a5 is just an immediate error. Knight e5, this is just very simple chess. This is easy to see. Black is just stripping away the defenders from the king side. Knight c5, I give a couple other variations... Uh, and notes you can look at, but this is the main line. Uh, bishop x c5, and here black already has a very simple threat of bishop x h2 check. This, this is working in this variation. Uh, a couple of different lines. Knight c4 was played. This is just the last gasp of an error. Uh, queen c5 loses a very simple attacking play, and there's no good there's no good answer to knight g4 coming. H3, hey, the bishop would just take on g3 and we'd break the king side. Uh, Bishop a3 is given by Kasparov as perhaps the only chance of repelling the attack. And this is a direct quote, this isn't paraphrased. Um, but just after simply queen e6, so now black just has a very simple threat of queen g4. These, look at how powerful these bishops are. Just absolutely annihilating the white king side. This is decisive. Knight f1, and the decisive move that I think he missed is knight h5 here. Uh, he gives knight d5. Uh, but knight h5 is superior for the main reason of, on queen xa7, knight h5 allows bishop, G, bishop xg2, and this is completely decisive. Uh, but on the a superior queen b5, just simple chess, rook b8, and four, and black just has a crushing position. Yeah, th this is equal material. We have to remind ourselves that black has a, has, hasn't actually sacrificed any material to get this position. Um... This pawn on d3 is absolutely crushing. Black's activity is crushing. He's got 92 check coming, which will bring that pawn to the second rank. Um, this this is completely decisive. There, there's no good way for white to survive this. Um, but bishop a3 would be more complex, and this would still give white a chance to prove, uh, make black prove that he can make moves. But whereas after knight c4, this is as cl classic a sacrifice as you can get. Uh, the rook coming to d5 first allows another piece to help out with the attack. Sort of building the lily at that point. Uh, king takes, I guarantee you, uh, Spassky was known for his sportsmanship and gentlemanly nature. Uh, he's taken an h2 just to allow Tao uh, sort of a flashy, well-deserved finish. King f1 would technically prolong the game, uh, but not in any way that actually matters. So Spassky does sort of a classy thing. And Spassky resigned here. This was... We just passed move 22, and Spassky uh, resigned. This is, to my knowledge, the fastest that Spassky ever gotten defeated. Um, and this is 1979, so he wasn't exactly out of his prime at this point. You know, this was just seven years after he lost the world title. He was still in his mid-40s, so still a world-class grandmaster. At this point, his rating was 2640. Um, to my knowledge, at that point, that would be second or third in the world. Uh, just behind Karpov, who was around 2,700. Um, yeah, this is, no joke. A player like Spassky losing, losing in 22 moves is uh, nothing to laugh about. But typical beautiful Tal attack. 
Again, most of the hoo-ha written about Tal doesn't actually account for much. Um, the key to this game... Again, we always want to look at these transition points. When you transition to Hanging Pawns, ideally, you're getting pressure against the Hanging Pawns more or less immediately. Here, White's not accomplishing that. So this is objectively still balanced, but subjectively, I prefer to side with the Hanging Pawns just because it's more aggressive. Um, and you see this in the way White's playing. Black is just directly playing for a breakthrough, whereas White is sort of having some difficulty in finding a plan, because he doesn't really have a plan here, because there's no way to attack these pawns. And then d4. When you have the hanging pawns, always a always be looking and potentially aiming for the move d5, d4. It is so often the key to the position, especially when you have your bishops lined up in this ideal fashion. That is the move that unleashes all of your activity. Um... And this is a pawn sacrifice, but Spassky didn't take the pawn sacrifice. And at this point, this is already a decisive attack. Um, but really, again, to stress, the key move to hanging pawns is d5, d4. Always be looking for this breakthrough. This is the move that you always want to be on the lookout for. That's what you want to be eternally preparing for and setting your minor and major pieces up to achieve. If you can achieve that move favorably in here, uh, it's a pawn sacrifice, so it's still even, but practically... It is favorable, because you're achieving so much activity and attacking chances from it that practically it's hard to defend against this. And even a world-class player like Spassi just gets completely blown away by this activity. This is just a complete whitewash, but it's quite reasonable to expect this from your own hanging pawn in the games if you play this well. So, uh, absolute model game. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be moving on to slightly more positional plans from hanging pawns. We're going to be looking at d5, d4 in terms of achieving a passed pawn and using that as an asset in uh, the end game. So, uh, my name is John. I'll see you then.